Thank you. So um, I'm, very, I'm very humbled that you would ask me to come. Um, the story behind Regeneration is a um, personal journey for me and also a collective journey for Taos and a collective journey for our whole world eventually. Um, but before I get into that story, I want to introduce myself in my mother's tongue to honor my ancestors. So, yad e shike do shidene. Hello, my relatives, my people. She'e Lila June Yanishye. I am Lila June. Nanisht eje tachit nishli. I am of the Black Charcoal Streak clan. Ado haskai dene bashishchin. My father is of the Cheyenne clan. Ado ashihe tashiche. My mother's father is of the Salt clan. Ado Balagana Scandinavian Dashanale. My father's father is Scandinavian. And Taos, New Mexico, Daint Nashan, which means I literally means I walk around Taos, New Mexico, but that's where I'm from. I guess technically Albuquerque, Daint Nashan, that's where I'm walking these days. Akut Ego Denest Anishli. In this way, I am a Navajo woman. Um, or really, Dene means people. It didn't necessarily mean Apache or Navajo or any certain race, it just meant people. Anyone with Bala'ashla, five fingers, was Dene. So you're all Dene too, according to our book. So the reason that we get our clan from our mother, <clears throat> and <clears throat> everyone, all four of my grandparents, you know, I named those four clans, and, they all got theirs from their mother <clears throat> because we were a matri matri matriarchal, probably more like matrifocal, actually. Uh, arc denotes power, right? Um, but we weren't matriarchal, we were more matrifocal, where we focused on the women. Um, the women were the center of everything because we knew if the mother was okay, then the husband was gonna be okay, the kids were gonna be okay, her grandchildren were gonna be okay. Everything's okay if she's okay. And so we really honored her quite profoundly. And we honored her leadership skills because she had her hand on the pulse of the needs of the children. And so wherever she went, we, we, we paid attention to what she was saying, what she was feeling. Um, because she had these instincts, motherly instincts, they call them. And those are real, that's a real thing. <laughs> and um, we honored those instincts. If we needed to camp here for the winter, we camped there for the winter. If we needed to <clears throat> give these, this part of this cornfield to those people and the other part we'll keep at our house, we'll do that. You know, she, she oversaw where the corn went. And also, you know, if, if uh, she was not being honored, she would put his saddle by the door. And that was, that's all she had to do. <laughs> and um, and uh, we gave all of our um, possessions when we die to the youngest daughter because she would be responsible for life on earth furthest into the future. And she would be the leader furthest into the future. And in this manner of honoring the women, so too were the men honored. They felt good. They felt like their women were protected, their women were happy, and they were, all, they were happy too. They got to help her give life. They got to help her bring life into existence. And so a lot of regeneration is about healing the women. Um, because when we heal the women, we heal everything. Um, and of course it's about healing our men too. They kind of happen simultaneously. And so that's a big part of it. They're doing studies, you know, when they give extra assistance, support, encouragement to the women, everything flourishes. Everything from the economy to 
um, depression levels, to suicide rates, to everything. If you can help the women, help the women reclaim their, their self as, as, as beautiful, as, as able, as honorable, as dignified, we treat them with dignity and honor. Everything will do And so, um, because she's, she's the center of the four directions, she's the only reason any of us are here. And so, she gives birth to eyes that see the four directions. And so, um, that was a good revelation for me once I realized that being a woman is a blessing. Um, because I didn't always understand that um, for many reasons. So anyways, regeneration is very much about um, being resilient. It's about bouncing back like the, um, the forest does after a forest fire. You basically take in the ashes of a catastrophe and you, 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 you use those ashes to nourish the seeds and the shoots of the coming generation and you metabolize adversity, and you, you use it to make you stronger, more motivated, more dedicated. Uh, for instance, this morning, I had a hard morning because I used to be a mentor at Taos Day School on the Pueblo, you know, because I'm Navajo, but I grew up with those guys over there. But um, <laughs> um, I think I was in fifth grade, and she was in kindergarten, and we had book buddies, so I was her book buddy. I would read to her, and um, she was so cute, you know. She would always look up at me with these little hands, just all nervous and just big eyes, and she just loved me so much, and I loved her too. She was like my little sister. And um, this morning I found out she has gallbladder stones, you know. She's, she's probably only about 20 years old. Um, they say your gallbladder is supposed to be the size of a plum, but hers is the size of a grapefruit. And that made me really sad, you know, because I know that that physical disease she has is really a reflection of a spiritual wound she must have picked up since last time I saw her when she was, you know, seven years old or so, whatever it was. And I wondered what happened to her, you know, because we don't just get sick out of nowhere. It's usually a result of some kind of spiritual wound that we haven't yet healed they say our body is a reflection of our spirit. And so if someone's getting cancer at age 30, it's usually some, or age 40 or 50, it's usually because there's something else that they haven't let go of. They haven't understood that they are, it's not their fault, you know, so they're holding on to it. Um, and so I was real sad this morning because I thought, what happened to her, you know? Who would hurt her? What would give her this spiritual wound? But at the same time, as I was sitting at the river at the Pueblo, crying for her, something inside of me was, was getting stronger. Some, some fire in me was, was praying harder. And I just thought, wow, creator, can you please help her? Can you please, please help her? She's so beautiful, she's so innocent, she's so kind. She should not die at this time. She's only 20 years old. And so, I started to feel this love growing in my heart. And this adversity, this travesty, you know, empowered me to kneel down and pray. And they say every healing begins with a prayer, a selfless prayer for another. Or if you're praying for yourself, obviously, it's, it's about yourself, but knowing that we love them. And so with Taos, we had a, a rash of suicides. I think it was about four in one month. Really beautiful people, some of which I knew. Um, and some as young as like, you know, 17 years old, taking a bunch of pills. They just didn't want to be here. And to have four of our young people die in one month, whew, we were, we were going through a lot. But the interesting thing was, the more that we lost, the more fired up we became. And we said, okay, we're gonna do something. So we lost them in July. <clears throat> and by September, 
we had created an entire festival for children. And it was huge and it was beautiful. And all the kids remember it to this day. <clears throat> and we had um, workshops for the youth. We had community hikes. We had a sweat lodge every evening to pray for them. We had all the churches in town giving moments of silence. We had all of these things going on for the children, for the next generation, and it was a celebration. It was a celebration of the youth, of the young. And we ended up calling it Regeneration Festival because we wanted to regenerate like the forests do. And we took these, these young people who we, we lost and we decided we were gonna bounce back. We were not gonna give up. And I do believe that ever since we started this festival five years ago, every Labor Day, that we have saved lives and we have done our small part to make this world a better place. And one of the most interesting things about this festival is it spread like wildfire around the world. Don't ask me why, don't ask me how. But we have so far had 35 festivals around the world happen in 13 countries. Uh, they celebrate with us during Labor Day weekend and they celebrate the children. And we started to understand, wow, this is actually a great technology, social technology, because if you think about it, the world is so hard for us to unite around anything. But one thing that we united around was the children, whether you're African descent, Asian descent, Australian Aboriginal, European descent, your Turtle Islander descent, doesn't matter what kind of color you are, you all have kids and you all love them. Or if you don't have kids, you've been a kid and you know what it's like to want more love. And so we started to see how this festival was, was uniting the world and we're doing it again this September if you'd like to join us. Uh, it can be large or small. One young man in um, South Africa, he simply brought bread to all the kids in the slums. That was his regeneration festival. You know, these kids are starving. <laughs> and he went out and he, he gave them all bread and candy. And so you go to um, India and they have a special ceremony called Raksha Bandhan. And they tied uh, little bracelets around their brother's wrists, and the brother in turn vows to protect his sister forever. And this was right during the height of when all of these abuses of women was happening in India. And, um, and then you have in Denmark, a woman invited all these girls over to her house and made cupcakes with them. You know, it's like, whatever you want to do. Um, so these are ways that we can, we can bounce back. And um, in my own life, you know, as a, as a woman, I came here to help. That's why I came to Earth, and I know that very clearly. Um, and I carry medicine um, in, the, in the sense that I carry um, healing. It's taken me a while to get to that state, but, um, and so because I am such a, I have such potential to help, the other side, you know, some people call it the dark. Some people call it ma'i, coyote. Some people call it iktome, spider. Depends on what tribe you're from. This being didn't want me to bring what I am capable of bringing. Because when I bring love, when I bring peace, when I bring unification, there's no room for its hierarchy anymore. It can no longer reign over anything because we all see we're all equal. And so I'm a threat to its imaginary kingdom of slavery, <laughs> to be blunt. And so um, this, this dark being uh, did everything it could to, to destroy me. Um, it mainly worked through abuse, you know, abuse that women should not go through. 
that started happening to me when I was a little girl and continued through high school and through um, college. And, and the point of doing that to a woman is to make her feel like she has disgraced God. She has broken some silent covenant to God, which said, I will keep this vessel safe. I will keep my body pure and sacred so that when you send babies, I'm gonna be ready to hold it in a good way. I'm gonna keep all myself sacred. So if she feels like she's cooperated in something unsacred, which is how I felt, even though it wasn't my fault, but I managed to make it my fault in my head, um, it makes her feel like she doesn't deserve creator because she's a disgraced creator. She's a disgraceful woman. But the thing about grace is you can never disgrace. Grace is omnipresent and it's always with us no matter what. And on top of that, I didn't even do anything wrong in the first place. I was just hurt by other people. And so once I turned myself away from God, I said, oh, I don't deserve you. I've, I've been a bad person. I've disgraced the one thing that I was supposed to keep sacred. Um, then I kind of was left to the wolves in many ways. I didn't believe I deserved protection. Um, and so I started to do a lot of self-destruction. Instead of blaming all the people who did these to me, these things to me, I decided to blame myself. Oh, I shouldn't have walked into the room with him. Oh, I should have said no louder. Oh, it's my fault because, you know, I shouldn't have drank that night or whatever. I made up all these things. And um, then I realized that, you know, um, it's not my fault. But before I realized that, I, I turned all that hatred inward and I went into self-destruct mode. Uh, and I did a lot of chemicals. Uh, I started chemicals when I was 11. I started um, the marijuana. And then, which is what kind of, I grew up around, so I kind of never had a choice to begin with. So I kind of was raised into it. Uh, I started drinking alcohol when I was 12. And I started to do cocaine when I was 14. Uh, I started to do heroin when I was 15. Um, and by the time I got to be around 18 or 19, I was a drug dealer in college. And um, I, I completely forgot who I was. I forgot I was medicine. I forgot I was sacred. All the, the, the dark just hit me over and over and over until I forgot what I was. That's how it works. And so I just believed I didn't really deserve much at all. <laughs> um, and in turn, I started to harm others through selling those things to others. You know, I was very confused, very, very confused. And um, there came a point when I had to get down on my knees and pray to become sober. And that happened after I was studying abroad in Chile. Um, and there was an 8.8 .8 earthquake. And um, I was drinking a lot. I was doing a lot of ecstasy in Chile. Still managed to get good grades. I don't know how that happened. But I, I, was, I always kind of prided myself on being like a functional addict, which is how I got into Stanford. But once I got into Stanford, you know, it was pretty crazy. But in any case, this earthquake hit. I was on the third story of a 12-story building. And I just thought the building was going to collapse. Um, so I decided to jump off the balcony because I was so afraid. Um, and it was probably one of the stupider things I've ever done because I broke my hip and I broke my spine upon impact. Um, and so this was on February 27th at about 3.40 a.m. in Chile. And I couldn't walk for two months, which I started doing more drugs. And um, at a certain point, uh, like I said, it got to the rock bottom and it was like, okay, you might die if you keep doing this. <laughs> so what I decided to do was I decided to pray here in Taos, actually. Went back to my mother's home, which is a place of healing for me. And I went uh, to pray for a long time, a couple of days. And I said, Creator, can you please get me sober? Because if I don't, I think I might, I think I might leave. You know, I can't handle this. And you know what? Creator answered my prayer. 
And I've been about three and a half years sober to this day. And thank you. And that's what this song is about. So I'm going to play a song. It's thanking creator for getting me sober. Can you hear the guitar okay? Okay. I just want to thank you. want to thank, thank you, yeah, for everything you are. You taught me how to love myself. When nobody else believed in me, you see so now I give it all away just like you said yeah said I give it all away yeah like a burning flame yeah said I give it all away hey yeah oh every single day no longer live my life for myself now i live it for everybody else never knew you could be so poor and have so much wealth cause now i'm rich in my soul like never before Yeah, I said I'm rich in my soul And your love is my gold Yeah, I said I'm rich in my soul Like never before And now I I would die before I let them take me away Don't take me away Don't take me away In that chariot of flames All of the addiction and the pain Cause I am yours now Creator, I am your horse In your everlasting arms in your everlasting arms and I, I just want to thank you for everything you do just want to thank thank you yeah for everything you are <laughs> Just curious, um, how much more time do I have? How much do I want? <laughs> All right. If you need to leave, no problem. Um, yeah, I, um, that song really, uh, it's a celebration to and a testament to the fact that creator can heal anything. You know, after I prayed on that hill for sobriety, I wrapped a little red piece of cloth on my wrist to remind me, like, when you go back down from the hill, remember, you're trying to get sober. Guess how long I lasted after I got down from the hill? I lasted three days before I was drinking again. And I was so sad. I was like, wow, I made this vow and I just can't even get out of it. It's just like, I was like in quicksand, you know? I was so addicted to so many chemicals. 
And then what happened was, I went to a, a, about three months later, I went to a prayer circle. And I didn't really want to, I wasn't really the praying type, but I said, all right, you know, in that kind of way, I did like a native way, but I said, okay, let's go. And so there was um, a messenger there, and the messenger said, you know, you need to be retrained. You, you're a medicine woman, but everything you've been trained to do is wrong, so we're gonna retrain you. So I just said, okay. And they lived in Alabama, actually, so I went to Alabama. And uh, one week in Alabama, and I quit smoking cigarettes overnight. I quit drinking overnight. Actually, the drinking was the one thing that stuck with me for like a year or so, because it's so socially acceptable. But instead of drinking every day, I went to like once every two months. I was like, maybe I could just drink once every two months, it'd be okay. But no, that doesn't work either. Um, <laughs> so I had to just quit you know, completely. So now I've had no drop of anything for three years. But anyways. Um, that, what I learned in Alabama was very interesting. What I learned was that I was loved still by Creator despite all my flaws, despite all the drugs that I sold to people, which may have led to them getting hurt or may have led to them even getting abused because they're not in their right mind. They can't protect themselves. And despite all my flaws and all my mistakes, Creator loved me and said to me, you know, through these messengers, he said, stand back up, you know, you're a warrior. Dust off your shoulders, lift up your head. You know, I love you, and I care about you, and you have work to do on this earth still. And we want you in our army again, our army of love. And we want you to fight for Creator once again. So, the only weapons you have are love, truth, and faith. And they said, those are the only weapons you're ever going to need. But you're going to be able to help this world like you prayed to be able to do. And I know when he's saying that to me, he's saying it to all of us. You know, We can all take this adversity, take this trauma, take this pain, and say, you know what? I am sacred. And I am worthy of fighting for Creator. And I am worthy. And not only am I worthy, but I'm able. That's the big one, right? To be able to effectuate change in this world. To not have to sit back and watch it all fall apart in front of you. But to know that you have the ability to change the world. Whether it's in a small way or a big way. And I put that in quotations because sometimes helping a child, you know, as a teacher, that's just as big as, you know, creating a vaccine for some disease because that helps millions of people because this child is the world and you are the world to this child. And if you can help this child grow, you know, and if that's quote unquote all you do in this life, that is profound and that is beautiful. And that's one of the big lessons Creator gave me was, you know, maybe your job in this world is to help a few people, maybe it's to help a lot of people, but I, I decide that with you, and either way, it's good. As long as you're making a forward progress, any amount of forward progress is good. And so, he said uh, through these messengers, you know, one prayer is to say in the morning with my cornmeal or whatever you use, at dawn preferably, but I don't wake up at dawn very often, but I try, <laughs> is creator, may I help one person today, at least one person, you know. It's a simple prayer, it's a humble prayer, but even that is big. It's really big in this world. And more often than not, creator allows you to help a little more than one people that day too, maybe many. And so this is how we metabolize these things is, is knowing that Creator is with us and knowing that Creator is behind us and knowing that if we keep with our prayer, we will find a way to, to walk forward and, and heal. Um, when I started Regeneration Festival, I had no idea it was gonna go to 35 communities in 13 countries, no idea. Actually, it just started out as, I'm gonna do a pipe ceremony for the youth. 
the pipe is a Lakota pipe, and it's very simple. I said, I'm just going to do a little pipe ceremony. <laughs> but it snowballed, and it snowballed into this big thing. And so sometimes having the courage to take one step will lead you to other things, too. And, and, and not being afraid to fail, you know. That's another thing they said to me. Daughter, we're not asking you to be perfect. We're just asking you to try. Just try, you know. And that's, that's what I've been doing, just been trying. And uh, I'm oftentimes surprised at <laughs> what happens when I just give it a shot. Um, so anyways, at this point, I'd like to read a poem. Um, and then I'll sing uh, another song or two. And then um, I'd I like to open it up to, to you all if you want, you know, no pressure. But if you want to share anything or ask anything, you're welcome to do so. Um, okay. This poem is uh, one I wrote for my grandmother. And, uh, yeah. It is dawn. The sun is rising in the sky. And my grandmother and I are singing our prayers to the horizon. This morning, she is teaching me the meaning of Honjon. Although there's no direct translation from the Navajo language into English, Every living being knows what Honjon means. For Honjon is every drop of rain. It is every leaf on every tree. It is your every eyelash. It is every feather on the bluebird's wing. Honjon is undeniable beauty. And my grandmother knows this well, for she speaks a language that grew out of the desert floor. A language like redstone arms reaching into the sky and praising creation for all of its brilliance. Jean is remembering that we are a part of this brilliance. It is finally accepting the fact that yes, you are a sacred song that brings the Dien Dene the gods to their knees with almost unbearable happiness. Jean is remembering our own beauty. It is in every breath that we give to the trees and every breath that they give to us in return. Jean is reciprocity. And my grandmother knows this well, for she speaks the language of a Luka Chukai snowstorm. She speaks the language of hooves hitting the dirt on birthdays, for she was a midwife, and she would gallop to the women in labor. And she became fluent in the language of suffering mothers, and she became fluent in the language of joyful mothers, fluent in the language of handing a glowing newborn to its creator. Jean is an experience. But it is not something you can experience alone. The eagles tell us as they lock talons in the stratosphere and fall to the earth as one. Jean is inter-beauty. And my grandmother knows this well, for she speaks the language of the male rain, which shoots lightning boys through the sky and pummels the green corn children and huddles the horses against the cliff sides in the early afternoon. And she also speaks the language of the female rain, which sends the scent of dust and sage into our hogans, into our homes, and casts rainbows in the sky. Us de we know what Honjon means. And each and every one of us in this room here we know what Honjon means. And I think that deep down inside, we also know what Honjon does not mean. Like the days we walk in sadness, like the days we walk in fear, like the days we live for money, or like the days that we live for fame, or like the day when the conquistadors came 
And they climbed off of their horses and they asked us if they could buy the mountains. Now, we knew this was not Honjon because we knew you could not own a mountain. But we knew we could make it Honjon once again. So we took their silver swords and we took the silver coins that they brought with them and we melted them with fire and buffalo hide bellows and recast them into squash blossom jewelry pieces. And then we placed it around their necks. We took the silver helmets off of their heads and we transformed it into a fearless beauty. We made jewelry. Honjon is the healing of our broken hearts. Honjon is the healing of our broken bones. Honjon is the prayer that carried my ancestors through genocide and disease. Honjon is the prayer that will carry us through anything, through even global warming, through even this global fear that dances like a shadow in our minds. This morning, my grandmother is teaching me something very important. She is teaching me that the easiest and the most elegant way to defeat an army of hatred is to stand before it and sing to it beautiful songs until it falls to its knees and surrenders to you. It will do this, she says, because it will have finally found a sweeter fire than revenge. <laughs> it will have found a sweeter fire even than greed. It will have found heaven. It will have found Honjon. And so my grandmother is talking to the colors of the sky at dawn. And she is saying, Honjon na hasli. Which means beauty and joy are restored again. It is dawn, my friends. Wake up. The night, the night is over. Thank you. I just feel like singing some more songs, is that all right? <laughs> Alabama 
Alabama. When I close my eyes, I see her face. The auburn horse with an angel's grace Feeding her young in all the ways That a mother can, oh yes she can When I dream at night Everyone's on the same side yeah, I feel what it's like to unite When I dream at night I see the fireflies light Dancing across the waters When I dream at night Dream of Alabama Ooh. Alabama ah. When I dream at night I see your eyes I look into them But I see through them I see into your soul and I think that it's so beautiful, oh yes it is. Searching for answers we already know Look inside my people, I look into your soul That's where you find that the greenest grass grows To believe is to see, to believe is to be So let's believe in peace, let's believe in the dream Yeah, Let's believe in peace, let's believe in the dream Tomorrow, today we are burning the sorrows of our fathers And all of those chains they say are wrapped around your feet Well assuredly I tell you they're imaginary Because we are free, yeah we are free We always have been and we always will be I said we always have been and we always will be Chessboard. The world is a dance floor, so give me your hand, people. Let's get down, yeah. Dancing down Wall Street, dancing down Main Street, dancing down any street. You and me, no, it don't cost no money to jam with me. No, it don't cost no money, cause jamming is free. I said it don't cost no money, cause jamming is free. Hey, hi, oh, hey, hi, oh.
I think that's the best I've ever sang that song. <laughs> it's all because of you guys. You're like reciprocating. Thank you. <laughs> Say more. <laughs> Um, I have a poem and more songs. Songs, <laughs> okay. Yeah, we were all given sacred duties to this land. Take care of Mother Earth and she will help us understand that everything we need is in the palm of her hands. No need to drill, mine, conquer, or extract. With faith in the creator, we will blaze a brand new path. When we let go of fear, the greed turns into laughter. Unity of all people, that is what we're after. I'm cruising down the red road with sweet grass on my dashboard. I used to drug and drink, but now I'm sober. Now I'm faster, sharp as a tacky tome. Can't hold me back now. I just want to build a new world for my children With love, prayer, and unity this nation is rebuilding Up from the ash of genocide and division Red, black, yellow, white as one, that's the vision Every race participates in this new beginning Sacred is the masculine and sacred is the feminine Infinite, indigenous, continuous, deliberate Nothing can stop the people once they got their intention set Some people say that the land can be owned But deep in our hearts we know no, it isn't so, cause we don't even keep this flesh or this bone. No, we can't take it with us on the soul's journey home. No, the only thing we keep is the lessons that we know. So when we wake from the slumber to remember we are one. One beautiful people under one beautiful sun. We must also release all claims to the earth. Cause she don't belong to us. No, we belong to her. <laughs> Penasco was meant to be a place where we could learn. We pray to the mountains for a blessing on the world. We practice satyagraha because violence doesn't work. We pray for those who are injured and those who injure. Unconditional prayer for the whole wide world. We sun dance year round, yeah, we let the sage burn. Cause when we pray for the people, we will start to understand what it means to be true woman, what it means to be true man. Cradled in the arms of the sky and the sand, just a strand in the tapestry of the master plan because together there is nothing that we cannot achieve said together there is nothing that we cannot achieve said together there is nothing that we cannot achieve no together there is nothing that we cannot achieve find love find healing find unity Mm. All right. So, you know, it's really um, a pleasure and an honor to, to be here with all of you. Um, I just really appreciate you um, giving me so much love and, 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 you know, letting me sit up here and blab at you as if uh, my story is more important than yours. I'd love to hear your story, too. I'm sure there's so many things you all have to say. And so... I'm very humbled that I'm the one up here saying things. And, you know, my story, uh, I think a lot of people think that it's, it's a real rare story to have that much crazy stuff happen to you. But, you know, it was not too long ago that I thought I had a normal life. I was like, oh, I've had a great life. Great, you know, schools, great parents. Da, da, da. It was great, you know. But then... As I started to like kind of uncover a little bit and like really look at my life, it's like, oh wait, that's not supposed to happen to a kid. That's not supposed to happen to a teenage. You know, you kind of start to unpack. So I really appreciate all of your stories too, and all of the the things that you have overcome to stand here, to sit here. And I know that each and every one of you have have undoubtedly gone through a lot, even if you're. Uh, young person, you know, our young brother here. We've all been through a lot. We've all um, overcome so much 
probably more than we even know. <laughs> and so I think ultimately the, the final most important lesson is forgiveness, you know. Because all these people, yes, they hurt me. Yes, they were selfish. Yes, they, they didn't really care about me. As, as long as they could get away with it, they were fine with it. But you know what? I didn't really heal until I said a prayer for each one and every one of them. And said, you know what, Creator? May you please bless this person. May you please help them to feel your grace, even no matter what they've done. Unconditionally, I, I love them. That doesn't mean I go have tea with them or go hang out with them, you know, because they might hurt me again. But from a safe distance, I can forgive them, and that's how I heal inside. And so that, that forgiveness doesn't mean what they did was okay. It just means that they handed you hatred, and in response, you hand them love. And that's one of the most powerful medicines on earth, they say, is when we hand love to those who hand us hatred. And, and that's why I think Gandhi is so important and why Martin Luther King is so important and why Christ is so important and why Sitting Bull is so important is because all of these people, they decided to respond to hatred with love. And, and that's really what, the, what we can do in this world. As my mentor said, you can't always control what happens to you in this life, unfortunately. Sometimes you just get blindsided and there was really nothing you could do about it. But what you can control is how you respond. That's something we can control. And so a lot of, we're a lot of hard things happening in our communities, a lot of hard things happening in Taos, Penasco, Los Angeles, you know, Vancouver, Mexico City, you name it. Our world is going through a hard time. But what we can do is we can love. We can love ourselves, which is sometimes the hardest part, but honestly the most important part for me. Because it wasn't until I loved myself that I could step into my role as a medicine person. But we can always love ourselves, choose to love ourselves unconditionally, you know. Just as I forgave and loved those men and women who hurt me, you know, um, so too can I forgive myself despite all of my flaws, and trust me, I have many of them. And through that unconditional love, not only of others, but of ourselves, you know, say, yeah, you made quite a few mistakes this life. <laughs> you could make a list as long as this pathway here. But you know what? That doesn't really have any bearing on how much Creator loves you and how much you can choose to make this day a day of, of prayer, a day of love and compassion. And so, we do have that power always um, to, to love another, love our people, work to help them. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all.